This episode contains discussions of weight loss methods and diet culture, as well as brief mentions of child abuse. Listener discretion is advised. It's one thing to start your own church, but this fervent leader created an intense group that slowly took over its members' lives, allegedly controlling who they married, how much they weighed, and even what psychiatric medication they were allowed to take. It looked like an empire that would continue to grow and last forever. Then, a sudden tragedy changed it all. What's next for this controversial group? This week's episode is Gwen Shamblin Lara and the Way Down Diet, Part 2. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Well, we always like to start off with thank yous. Mm -hmm. And I would like to thank... I think this episode more than we've ever done, and this is 148, mm -hmm. we have received so many personal stories from listeners about how they related to the last episode, how they were touched by the things we said, how they really appreciated the way that we handled the subject matter. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for sharing all of that with us, because people often tell us, you know, you guys are so brave for talking about your, your lives and, and struggles. But we, Heather and I say offline a lot, like one reason we're able to do that is because of the compassion and appreciation that it's met with from you guys. So thank y'all for being so sweet and supportive that allows us to feel like we can be vulnerable with everybody. And for being so open in all the messages mm -hmm. and um, we got DMs, we got tagged and stuff. And we had some some people were sending me pictures of them wearing tank tops and saying that they were on vacation and they oh, were stressed nice. out. And I was I on purpose. I was like, I'm showing the guns, sun's out, guns out. You know, despite I do have that insecurity about my arms. I'm like, we're all brave together. Like, let's do it. We all deserve to, you know, be happy and mm -hmm. wear whatever or not even be, you know, and that someone else messaged, which I thought was such a great point of we do get so ingrained in our heads of, you know, saying, well, as long as you're healthy, it's OK. But people who aren't healthy also deserve to be loved. People who aren't sure. happy deserve to be loved. And so I think this has really helped us. And, and we always want to be better. And, you know, you know, people write in and say, oh, you know, this word upsets me or this word is, you know, technically means this. Well, we always want to be kinder with our our words and with what we're saying. And so I appreciate that all the outreach we've had. We've also had experts writing to us, which I love that. We've had social psychologists and psychologists, therapists. We've had nutritionists, dietitians messaging and, you know, confirming, oh my gosh, or saying, I can't believe someone was a reg registered dietitian and said, I, you know, it makes me like ashamed that she is taking our, mm -hmm. you know, professional designation and basically using it to trick people. And I said, you know, I feel the same way when there's, you know, dirty lawyers out there, you know, or dirty uh, investment people, you know, Bernie Madoff and things like that. When anytime with somebody from your profession, you know, kind of tarnishes it. Um, so people writing in and I'm like, you know, that just means your your job is unfortunately that much harder, but then also that much more precious because you have that responsibility, that professional designation that you can help people unlearn all this stuff. So like Christy said, thank you guys. And and we couldn't say, I, I, you know, it's not comfortable to say any of this without knowing that it's met with such kindness. So I, I definitely appreciate all that because it's a sensitive subject. And I think the world is hopefully going in the right direction, but it's still there's a billboard in Times Square right now. Someone sent us and it says, are you fat and lazy? <sighs> and it has a, a, you know, bigger girl in a sports bra kind of bent over sobbing and it's this Instagram influencer that's like I can help you lose weight you fat lazy jerks and it's just like what are you thinking and oh, the New York Post God. wrote about it and she shared the post article and was like thanks for helping me spread my message guys and it's like it's not, let's read the room my dude <laughs> read is the she, room so she's bigger and is having no 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 she's, she's, oh, real, she's, a, she's very thin she's targeting fat people yeah and, it, and equating fatness with laziness, which we know is not true. No. Not the case. And extreme fat phobia, yeah. And Jamila Jamil's, you know, spoken out about it and some other folks as well. So 
as like I said, I think we the response we've gotten from this has been lovely and hopefully helping people unlearn things that we've all had just beaten into our brains mm-hmm. over the past, you know, multiple decades that we're all having to kind of come through this together, but uh, clearly not over yet. Yeah. And to your point of dietitians saying, like, I can't believe that she was one of us. We got mm-hmm. some messages as far as um, from religious people as well that were like, mm-hmm. I just want you all to know, like, this is as a Christian, like, I am horrified that someone would like act like the the God that we pray to would judge anyone for their body shape or condemn you or anything like that. So we are well aware that this is a a small little blip on the radar as far as what these people think. Most most people that fall under these categories of of Christianity or any, anything like they're good people. They believe Oh yeah, it's there's always a, a bad batch of anything. Sure. I think it's it's dangerous to make any, you know, blanket statement of like, well, Christians want you to lose weight. It's like, ah, no, this lady was yeah. bastardizing that the basis of the religion, such to the point that experts were like, nah, she ain't with us. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she knew. So I think uh, it's important to always be precise when we're uh, condemning a person and their uh, harmful system that they've created versus, you know, whatever that she took and tried to morph into her own and... We, we also had a listener reach out that is with the Church of Christ and said her Gwen Shamlin's beliefs of not believing in the whole Trinity is mm-hmm. not from the actual Church of Christ, that the Church of Christ teaches that they are all equal parts. And so that must have been something that her family kind of believed growing up or maybe her splinter group of of her church did but overall this listener was saying that is not that is not how, what they believe so i think if that's the case from an early age she was kind of splintering off from the mainstream and creating these these sects that uh were very harmful oh yeah and blame and blaming it on what well, that's just that's the truth it's like right. ah, i think you're making that up um, so thanks, everybody, for all your outreach. Yes. Uh, you know, if it meant something to you, that meant something to us. So thank you. And we also, uh, on a more material note, <laughs> we have got some fabulous gifts this week. Uh, Jemima Williams sent Ella and Simon some beautiful children's books that her husband writes and she illustrates. That's amazing. Which, what an amazing thing to do with your partner. There, one was called 100 Feet Tall, and the other one is Hibernate With Me. And the illustrations are beautiful, and they're very sweet. I read them to Simon and Ella, and they both like them very much. So thank you so much, Jemima. And then Heather. <laughs> your cup runneth over. I received two things this past week that... While they are similar, um, they are also, they've produced a new bit in my mind for Judge Christie. (laughs) So so I've received multiple gavels. (laughs) You got too many gavels. No, you can never have too many. (laughs) It's true. Sam, thank you so much for the gavel that you sent me. It is a beautiful wooden gavel. It's uh, It has a metal plate that's inscribed that says the Honorable Judge Christie. Which it's I, so elegant. It's very, my father would be so proud. He, he was a, my father was an actual judge. So I feel like I'm living uh, through, this is all through him. And then my father-in-law, George Brown, also mm-hmm. got me a gavel that is also inscribed that says Judge Christie, Precinct 13. Yes. Yeah. And then the show's name. So I now have two gavels and Judge Christie's gonna gonna start ruling on there's gonna be some rankings now. Oh, I love it. If a case I'm into it. if a case is one gavel or two gavel, like we're gonna have a gavel ranking of I love it. How strict this <laughs> ruling is. So if I get more gavels, then the rankings just increase. I'm going to get you a comically oversized gavel. If you guys are not Patreon subscribers, uh, it's never too late. Uh, we have a bit called Judge Christie we do on there where I read Christie 
uh, either articles or um, legal advice questions. And she's the judge and her rulings are final. And uh, it's a lot of we, we I think we get into a lot of ethical, moral mm-hmm. kind of discussions. And we just laughed our ass off the last one because of uh, somebody had a real wacky house dispute <laughs> that was uh, we got into and a like a real wacky house. And mm-hmm. then uh, a man's precious, precious collection of uh, materials, some uh Sensitive materials so as well many as materials. a tambourine, so- <laughs> tambourine and his comforter. <laughs> so, uh, and whether you know he should get reimbursed for the destruction of his very sensitive, hilariously titled materials. So, Judge Christie can now rule with both hands. Yes, it's uh, some people double fist it, I double gavel it, and that'll probably <laughs> go on a t shirt at some point. Absolutely. Which, I by the it. way, is it happening? It's happening, Heather. I think I am I am pulling the trigger. We're going to keep adding stuff, but the new merch site as soon as we're done recording, I'm going to finish integrating everything. So by the time this comes out tomorrow, if everything goes according to plan, the new merch site will be live and everyone we'll can launched. see what we have been working on for months now. Um and get ready cuz there's some just... there's some real fun stuff. And then we still have stuff that we like are holding back that we are going to release later. So there's going to be some even more new stuff coming out. It'll be unfolding over the course. Mm-hmm. I, but I will, I just want everyone to know if it were up to me, I just would have stuck a, you know, merch side up like weeks ago and it would have been like, fine. <laughs> this is so precise. There's like descriptions. There's thought that's gone into everything. The way that things have been, you know, sh- centered or like, the way things are displayed, the organization, the category. I mean, Christy goes through everything with a fine tooth comb and the merch site. I just want to give Whoa. glory where it is due. Thank because you. Because you're so phenomenal much. and thoughtful about everything. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. I um I think I texted you <laughs> the other day. I said, You have no idea what this project has done to me. <laughs> because, and because uh. you said I said things can either be this way or that way. And you said well, why don't you just do it both ways? And I go, Heather, I cannot have that. Like, it either has to be this way or that way. Everything has to be consistent. And, man, you and Tommy. And then I said something to Tommy, and he was like, why don't you just have it both ways? I I go, I already told Heather I cannot do that. I have to have it. It's just. So, uh, yes, oftentimes my obsessiveness with things, with perfectionism can be good. And other times it can be exhausting for everybody. So you and Tommy have been very patient with with me as well. So thank I'm you. I'm like, it's not exhausting, just whatever. And you're like, no, I will feel better if it's not whatever, if it is correct. And I'm like, whatever makes you feel better then. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> See, that's that. why people that don't have the issues that I have, they're like, well, isn't it exhausting? And I'm like, if I feel like it's worse. It's I worse sleep. if I, <laughs> yes, it's kind of like uh, Monica on Friends. Like, if, yeah. you know. It's it's worse if I don't do something to fix it. So, but it's almost there. So, uh, well, hopefully, all goes according to plan. And then this is is, is up tomorrow. I'm gonna go uh, buy a bunch of crap off there too. I am. Too, I want. I want them all. I'm like, I'm gonna wear the shirt yeah. of the show I'm on. I'm very proud. Absolutely. Of Same here. Well, if you haven't listened to part one, go back and do that because. A lot was covered in part one, and we're just oh, yeah. going to jump right into a lot being covered in this one as well. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. After divorcing her husband of 40 years, David Shamblin, in 2018, Gwen Shamblin married actor Joe Lara that same year on August 18th. The ceremony and reception were held at the Remnant Fellowship Church in Franklin, Tennessee. The RSVP indicated the dress code was black tie. Over 1,500 people attended the lavish event, which lasted into the wee hours of the morning, according to the video uploaded to YouTube, the covenant wedding of Gwen Shamblin to Joe Laura. There's uh, not really a reason listed in the divorce paperwork as to why they divorced. Um, But folks who were members of the church said that David was a member in kind of nominally, like, Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a part of it, but that he wouldn't come to any of the events and things like that. And then I saw a photo of the two of them together, Mm -hmm. and he is a bigger person. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if some of that had something to do with it. You know, I had the very same thought. I also thought it was a little interesting because 
so many things that I had read said that divorce was very much looked down upon, that, Mm -hmm. you know, Gwen said, once you find that person, that you should stick with them, you know, for better or worse. And if you you don't, then you're not giving yourself to God and having a God-centered marriage. Isn't it funny, though, when she decided she wanted to get divorced, that the language on the Remnant Fellowship website all of a sudden became, if you did not have a true God-centered, honest relationship in the first place, then it's okay to get divorced. Or if the person was unfaithful to you. But then it also specifically said, if your partner does not agree to basically believe what the church wants you to believe, then that's also cause. So I wondered if these things were all kind of like, calling out her husband like he didn't want to although he came up with the the helped found the church and everything in the beginning maybe he just wasn't as into it also he was he was a bigger person and she said i'm gonna find someone that um looks better on my arm as far as she's concerned yes fits the image that she wants to uphold yeah i mean he played tarzan in the 70s he was all about his shirt being off, you know, looking looking good and everything. So, yep, it's um, it's interesting. And I couldn't even find where she met Joe, but they divorced in 2018, and then she got remarried that same year. So, oh, you said where she went? Oh, yeah, it was all I don't very know fast. How quickly it all happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a great question though, because you know what is it? Back in the, <laughs> it was. Was it King Henry VIII who was like, I actually need a divorce, so I'm going to change the rules. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So how convenient to just be, that's what happens when you're in charge, though, mm-hmm. is that the rule doesn't fit you. You just go, you know what, though? That was a bad rule. And this yeah. new one, this is the one. This is the with. actual rule. Yeah. And then everyone just eats it up. Also, everybody just go check out the covenant wedding of Gwen Shamblin to Joe Lara because it is a roller coaster ride. I got to call that videographer to do my wedding because I, <laughs> I would love it. I would love the crossfades. Oh, uh, the, man. Yeah. Just I, I say uh, your whole wedding is planned out for you. Done. Copy. Exactly. <laughs> the dress, the hair, the, oh, my God, how many people were in that wedding party? 30 on each side. It was At ridiculous. Least. It was enormous. It and was the wild. children that danced in circles on the stage. Oh, uh, it was yeah. a lot. It was a lot going on. Yeah. Well, Gwen Shamblin and Lara also played matchmaker for many other Remnant Fellowship weddings, always officiating the ceremonies, which take place at the church or on the expansive grounds of her estate. In their YouTube series, Life with Gwen and Joe, one episode features members of the church preparing for an upcoming wedding. As Gwen and Joe walk around the grounds, Gwen points out how everyone has their role and that the weddings are seen as a community celebration. I watched too many episodes oh, of Life with Gwen and Joe. It, it sucks is a you homemade, in. It's a homemade reality show yeah. on YouTube. Very you homemade. Watch. Very homemade. Yeah. This was odd. And I believe this one was at her estate, which is gigantic. I mean, the grounds are, it's like the Arboretum. It's, it's freaking mm-hmm. huge. But it's days before, I mean, they take like, a week to prepare for these weddings, which happen all the time. Mm-hmm. And the whole church gets involved and everyone's either like hanging string lights, building like uh, the altar area, basically, mm-hmm. the the gazebo type thing, setting up chairs. Even the bride and groom were, were helping at some points. And then I read on a forum that had a lot of ex-members on there that, the bride and groom, the parents still have to pay for the wedding, but they're, they reduce the cost a lot because everybody chips in. But it's not like she just allows everyone to get married at her estate and they don't have to pay her. Former members paint a much different picture. They say the marriages are often arranged, with Gwen having to approve the couples. Gwen also has final say over all the wedding details, including bridesmaid dresses, flowers, food, and invitations. If a bride's father is not a member of the church, she must ask for Gwen's approval for him to walk her down the aisle. 
this is when it goes from we are running a wedding venue to we are having a membership retention policy where you can only marry other members yeah. and your family that's coming and can only either be not rabble rousers or they can be members. Yes. And people on this forum were like, there would be no way that you could have like aqua and pink bridesmaids dresses. Like she approves like every color, the food that's there, like every little detail. It's basically her wedding, but it's also mm-hmm. because it's, it's, oh, and they also said, she has to approve everyone that's in your wedding party and that I, only I that. only thin people would mm-hmm. be approved because she wants all the pictures. And that's what it is. Everything's filmed. All of these weddings. Good God. There's a there's a super cut on YouTube of all the weddings. It's like literally 100 couples, just their faces. Why that was necessary, I don't know. To show how happy everyone is, I suppose. Mm-hmm. They're all young very good looking, thin, but at what cost? But that's why they she controls so much of it is so when all these videos are put out or all these pictures on their website, every it it all looks like it's uh, very Instagram worthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look how happy everyone mm-hmm. is and how beautiful they are yes. too, because that means you're children of God. Mm-hmm. While videos of the beautiful nuptials and footage on life with Gwen and Joe depict a harmonious and joyful congregation. Behind closed doors, many members of the church felt differently. Regarding the restrictive nature of the church, a former member named Terry told Geraldo at large, They don't want you to read anything that's on the internet. Terry was also told to stop taking her doctor-prescribed antidepressants and was told instead to follow God. She also said the church leadership spanked her kids. Yeah, this was uh, not, and it was pretty... You know, it wasn't this was not recent. Geraldo at large, this footage was from a couple years back. So this is stuff that was, I guess, kind of out there. But because the congregation was told not to pay attention to the Internet, they weren't going to be informed that this is some things that happen within the church. You know, if you get new recruits on the hook and you say, well, part of this is that you actually can't look at the Internet except for our websites, then you're not going to see this kind of stuff. Although this was on TV, but it was I mean, back then it was. That's like Geraldo at large was kind of like what inside edition where it yeah. plays like one time. It's not like in syndication. Yeah. And we've seen that with tons of other cults, too. They control mm-hmm. what you read. They control what comes in, what goes out as far as books or literature. Mm-hmm. There's a Buddha field. Yes. There's was, settings on all. Yeah. There's settings on the Internet. So you can't can't see stuff. And that's all intentional because they don't want you seeing what other people are saying. And even if you did. Of course, those people are Satan. They're, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, out to get you. They're not, they're uh, enemies of the church and everything. It becomes a very much us versus them mentality, which I think starts to be, you know, if we're checking off the cult boxes, that's Mm -hmm. one of the big ones of like, we have to protect ourselves. It's us versus them, not an openness and a lovingness, which, um, you know, that's what what we see here is it's all about what she wants. Yes. Exertion of control. Yeah. On at least one occasion, Gwen instructed a male member of the church to weigh his wife regularly and report back to Gwen with the results. Once the couple left the church, Gwen issued an email to the congregation and told everyone not to talk to them, according to their interview on Geraldo at Large. In another incident, Gwen and church leaders told a member's husband to snatch away his wife's Prozac and flush it down the toilet, according to News Channel 5. Unashamed, Gwen confirmed that the church instructed the man to do this. She said they were they were asking for help. They were they wanted our help and we were helping them. The idea that you take a person's medicine from them and destroy it. And the husband, I believe, did not do that. He said no. And that's another reason why they left. So luckily, some of these more extreme requests, the people are when when the guy was told to weigh his wife, he's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to call you and let you mark this down also what the hell is this lady doing with her time that she has time to mark down i guess probably she just answered the phone you know she wasn't tracking it but luckily a couple of these members said uh no we're gonna be leaving after yeah. that and but then it's you're extremely dangerous yes and then you're enemies of the church and if you've made friends and stuff within the church that you actually like they're not allowed to talk to you anymore so it's not just like we see with tons of cults like with buddha field especially those people were best friends and you know mm-hmm. uh, their own little family 
And then when you break apart and you're told like you're not allowed to talk to those people anymore, it's it's very hurtful. And it's also a, another retention policy of if you leave, this will happen to you. Yes. If somebody told Tommy to weigh my ass every week, I cannot <laughs> begin to think how that would go. <laughs> no. First of all, you'd have to get me on the scale. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Hell no, no, I'm not don't, going in there. No, I don't weigh myself. That's just a way to immediately uh, get back into triggering that habits. Mentality. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, it's, but, and, and it, again, this is saying, hey, male. Exert control over female. Yes. Yep. Exert control. You weigh her. She's. Uh, we can't trust her to do it herself, or you take her medicine away. Mm-hmm. We can't trust her to stop herself. Go in there and exert control over her. And again, like you said last time, it becomes this whole morality thing where, well, if I prayed harder and I was better for God, then I wouldn't be depressed or have anxiety. And so I wouldn't need beds, which is such a dangerous way to mm-hmm. think. And same goes for the weight. Well, if I just, if I was a better Christian or I was loved more by God, then he would allow me to lose this weight. Some people, that's their body. Your body is your body. And Mm -hmm. like what we, so many of the things we received over the past week and just read too from professionals, doctors, nutritionists, dietitians, is that overweight does not equal being unhealthy. Correct. Which is a a huge misnomer. And it's just another thing, the diet culture and shoves down your throat to uh, the fat phobia. But you can be technically overweight and still be extremely healthy. So she's making these people not only physically unhealthy, but mentally unhealthy as well by taking away everything that makes them a healthy person. Oh, yeah. And especially when you conflate a physiological status like being depressed or, you know, having clinical depression or having some health related or not even health related, but having some weight related aspect of your life of like, this is just how I'm shaped or whatever, then you've suddenly created a person that's set up to fail because that's mm-hmm. physiological, physiologically how they are. And now you've equated that with a moral failing. So no matter what, they're never going to please God. So then they're going to spiral out into destructive behaviors and pattern, you know, e- almost eating disorders, basically, because you think, okay, well, all I have to do is just be better. I have to do it. It, it creates an environment that's ripe for extreme behavior mm-hmm. because of this I would say the technical term probably isn't mind fuck, but it kind of is because you, <laughs> yeah. it's, you're you're tricking someone into thinking that unless you can change this aspect of you that you can't change, it'd be like, well, Christy, if only you were taller, God would love you. So yeah. really what we need for you to do is try to stretch your feet every night at the end of the bed. You're never going to be taller. You mm-hmm. know, you are what you are. And so all you're going to ever do is go, God, I I'm, I'm, can't believe how stupidly short I am. What a loser. And it's like, no, that's you're as tall as you are. Mm-hmm. Like that just is. And so turning that into if God would love you if you change this, I mean, you really should have brown eyes. Right. Christy, why don't you have brown eyes? Because I'm not a child of God, Heather. I guess not. Apparently. Well, I sure am. So in your <laughs> face. But you know what I mean? It's no, just it something totally silly. makes sense. Like you can't change those things. Those are fundamental yeah. things uh, about you. Yeah. yeah. Two other members told News Channel 5 that Gwen told them that until they lost weight, they were not saved and were not children of God. Another member wrote on Reddit that after they left for college, they began questioning the church, then eventually left, saying, The final straw was being told that since I had gained some weight back, I was going to go to hell. Gwen denied these accusations. But honestly, wouldn't it? Again, all you see here is retention policy, right? Because if more people are in the church, then they're buying stuff, then they're paying for stuff, then that then you can buy a jet and you can buy a fancy house. Because if you say... Oh, no, I would never say that. That's good marketing, right? Mm-hmm. Of like, no, what, when you come in here, you will lose weight. And the people in those videos say, they don't say, I lost 25 pounds. They say, God took 25 yes. pounds from me, mm-hmm. which that man, that framing, of course, she knows she told him to say that too. Yeah. Because they all say the exact same thing. Well, and even in the last episode, we talked about the 11-year-old boy that had yeah. lost 10 pounds that said, God will tell me what he wants me to weigh. You know, yeah. it's it's all putting it like there's it's out of your hands, but in a very unhealthy way, like that you don't have control over anything you're doing. So then it becomes like 
well, I can't control, I can't control any of this, so I'm not responsible. And then that trickles down into other areas of your life where you're just like not accountable for things. And also you're judging yourself because you don't think that you're good enough. And that trickles down into it's. I mean, it's just this whole trickle down effect of this mind fuck that you're not good enough. You're never going to be good enough. And the only way you're going to be good enough is if you stay in this church, quote unquote, and allow me to teach you how to be better, which is cult 101. Yeah, it's all um, it's all ways to just make him stay, make him stick mm-hmm. to your point on the, the young child that many young children that she put on these uh, programs, a social psychologist who is an expert in eating disorders wrote in and let us know that dieting in childhood is one of the most well-established predictors of eating disorders in adolescence and that even talking about dieting and weight loss can have a lasting impact on their self-perception of their mm-hmm. bodies and understand not understanding that kids grow at different rates. Their weight is going to fluctuate as they go through different growing patterns and saying, well, there's a childhood obesity epidemic that instead saying, let's focus on joyful movement. Let's focus on intuitive eating, like listening to your body and not saying, oh, well, right now, 11 year old boy, you're too big. We need you to lose 10 pounds. Uh, because that basically what you've done is just set that child up for eating disorders um, in his later years. Yeah. Mm hmm. Melba Newsom, who wrote about her experience with the Way Down program for Self Magazine, echoed these sentiments, saying that when she first tried the program in 2002, Shamblin Lara's message focused more on learning to love God instead of food. Newsom said she found the program effective, even losing 10 pounds in the first month. However, by 2005, she said the program had changed. The message had become that overeaters were subject to eternal damnation. Another former member claimed Gwen and the church had a pattern to silence those who speak out against remnant, writing. That's what Gwen and her leadership does. That's how it's always been. If you speak out against them, they'll either, one, use the law to try to silence, intimidate, or corner you. Two, use your loved ones who are still in the church as a tool to intimidate, threaten, or emotionally distress you in any manner. Or three, demonize you and make sure that everyone in the congregation knows that you're now an enemy of the church and of God. All classic cult stuff. Every cult yeah. we've covered, this is is what they do. Fear yeah, tactics. Checking the boxes, and especially enemies, this mm-hmm. us versus them. Yes. According to gotquestions.org, a ministry dedicated to answering spiritual-related questions, other former members have been vocal about the total control Shamblin Laura maintained over the lives of her congregation. Her control extended far beyond the church walls, where members were allegedly not allowed to read any material that was not written by her, not allowed to listen to any music except that of her son, Michael, and forced to obtain Gwen's approval or rejection over every decision of the membership. Boy, if you are a struggling musician and your mom is in charge of a spiritual group, cult, question mark, Mm -hmm. boy, that's the easiest way to get them listen downloads up on Spotify. (laughs) Be like, all y'all can stream is Michael. These (laughs) CDs is all y'all can listen to. Then suddenly, you know, your concerts are packed because, I mean, it's by force. But at the end of the day, does it matter really if you're just rocking out up there, even if everyone's like just empty eyed and just distraught that they have to be there? But they, but even if they feel that way, nobody's going to say that. It just becomes this echo chamber of how great you are. And it's the same way reason that people let her walk around with her hair like that, which is also all over the forums of the ex-members of what we were saying. of This is the way that she looked, basically, is indicative of all of the yes people that were around her and mm-hmm. that no one, I mean... The people on the forums, rightfully so, were very angry and said a lot of things that, um, you know, weren't the best way to describe how somebody's dressed. But the the makeup, the hair, the clothes, they said if anybody uh, was really voicing their true opinion that they would have told her how they felt. But everyone was scared of her and just were yes people. No one was going to tell her what what was what she actually looked like and one of the forms we read too which i know is you know in a situation like this if if people are scared a couple of the people were parents of children adult Mm -hmm. children who were in the group still and so they felt like they couldn't be uh 
they could only be anonymous on the internet yeah. because the church was monitoring these forums is what they understood. And so they said, you know, if I say who I am, then my kids aren't going to talk to me anymore. And that right now I'm only allowed to just talk to them on the phone because they're so deep into the church. So I totally understand them not wanting to reveal their identities. Sure. Plus, as we'll see, there's going to be lawsuits involved uh, with people writing things online. And so uh, it's, it's, as, take it at, at what you will. You know what I mean? Like, we understand it's a forum, that it's anonymous people writing it, but in a situation where their loved ones and family members are at stake and they don't want to lose contact with them, I respect and understand that they want to remain anonymous. Sure, for sure. As far as her having approval or rejection over all the decisions the members made, I read some stuff where one woman consulted her about everything from how she should, the color paint she should paint her house to if she should put her mother in a assisted living facility to marital advice to I mean like she was they didn't do anything without running it past her first she had complete control over all of their lives and even all the details within their I mean the wedding the what your Mm -hmm. house looks like I mean it was all will Gwen approve of this will she like it in this need and desire to please and get praise which stems from that need and desire to to look good, to to weigh the amount she wants you to weigh, you know? Well, and also if she set herself up as the one true connection to God, of course you want to please that person. Sure. You don't want to go against them because in essence, that's the kind of trap of a cult leader who says that of David Koresh or whatever of, I am the prophet of God. So if you want to disagree with me, you're not just disagreeing with me. The big guy is up there too, or girl, we don't know. Um, and so I think that sh- that her kids have said in interviews, I think the daughter on one of the interviews said, you know, who is Gwen? Her daughter speaks. And she's like, she's incredibly generous with her time. She takes time to get to know members. But at the same time, she's not telling the members, you should be autonomous creatures. Paint your house whatever the color you want. Mm-hmm. I don't care. She's saying, I'm generous and that I will tell you what to do with your life. And that is you're manipulating people into thinking you're being generous, but really you're being controlling. And those kids have grown up with that their whole lives. So, I mean, who yeah. knows if they really believe it or they're just brainwashed. I mean, because I saw the daughter speak at one thing and yes, she was singing her mother's praises and there's nothing wrong with that. But it was all from from the time we were infants. My mother has been the most godly woman who taught us, you know, I mean, it's just she could do no wrong and like Mm -hmm. no matter how much you love your parents you can say something you have at some point in your life you had an issue with them you got into an argument Mm -hmm. everybody was a teenager for christ's sake and it's like none of that even happened which is very suspect that you so this woman has never done anything that you disagreed with you know i mean you've been under her thumb and your weight has been controlled since you could talk yeah. I mean, it it is a question when you're I'd love to, you know, know from like the, the mentality of growing up in a cult of at what point is it possible for a child of not just a member, but of a leader to break free as an autonomous being and understand these are not healthy habits. But if you can't read any outside mm-hmm. literature, you can't interact with any outside sources, you're never going to know. No. And I mean, you're in that, that bubble. It's un- unhealthy. Yeah. Everybody you associate with. I mean, again, it's just an echo chamber, this dangerous. Yeah. Echo- so, yeah, I don't I don't know what it would take to break somebody coming in and just taking you out. I mean, I don't know how you would have that revelation on your own that like this is unhealthy. Yeah. Marie Griffith, an associate professor of religion at Princeton University an author of Born Again Bodies, Flesh and Spirit in American Christianity said that while Shamblin Lara's way down philosophy may spark interest in creating a more holy body, there are also major dangers. In Shamblin's world, people who don't lose weight often feel like failures. If they don't lose weight, it's a failure of discipline. It's a failure of obedience. Sinister Hood will be right back. There's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hair care. A product that works wonders for curls might make straight hair limp and greasy. 
I have extremely long hair. I have not had a haircut since before the pandemic. It is. I'm at this point. It's a chat. I I want to see how long it can go. <laughs> and it hasn't been dyed, so I might donate it. And I can now because Pro's Hair Care has made my extremely long hair very luxurious. It's very shiny, and I get tons of compliments on it, even though it has not been trimmed or taken care of. It still <laughs> looks great, though. Figure. It looks Thank great. You. Yeah. Yes, I as we know, I've always struggled with flyaways. I've talked about it since I think day one of our podcast. And the special formula that pros came up with me helps smooth my hair. And now all I have to do is blow dry it. There's no flyaways. I don't have to put any product in it. And it looks so shiny and healthy. Thanks to my personalized pros routine, I can honestly say that I've never been more in love with my hair. Pros makes custom hair care that's effective because it's personal. Using natural ingredients with proven results, Pros customizes every product in your routine from shampoo to supplements. First, Pros starts by asking you about you as a person with their in depth consultation. Pros ask me really unexpected things like where I live, my hobbies, if I. It was like, how often do you exercise? Because I guess, like, how often are you going to wash your hair every week? Mm hmm. Um, what do you spend a lot of time outside in the sun? Is there going to be sun damage? So it, it kind of gives you an all around, uh, it gets you a 360 view of your hair and what you use it for. It took <laughs> into like account all sorts of things that I would have never even considered affected your hair, but it totally does when you think about it. And next, pros analyzed all of our answers and determined what unique blend of ingredients should be in every product of each of our custom orders. Together, pros got all of our hair goals covered. As a carbon neutral certified B Corp, Pros is an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty-free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. If you're not 100% positive, Pros is the best hair care you've had. They will take the products back, no questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash creepy. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash creepy for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. As we've talked about on the show before, we should seek out what's right for us and not compromise on what is most important. Our relationships should add value to our lives, including in the bedroom. So why don't we think the same way about our intimate products? Dame Products is a woman-owned sex toy company making the next generation of vibrators. Founded by a sex educator and an engineering whiz, Dame develops toys with the help of real humans and couples. All of their accessories are made with medical-grade silicone, smart design principles, and lots of love, earning glowing press from the New York Times, W Magazine, and many more. Whether you're a couple looking for an extra boost where it matters or on a journey of self-exploration, Dame products are sure to earn a spot on your nightstand. And the best part, Dame offers hassle-free returns with 60 days, so your satisfaction is literally guaranteed. Go to dameproducts.com slash creepy today for 10% off. Again, go to dameproducts.com dot com slash creepy today for 10 percent off as ex members began coming forward with their stories many began wondering if what started out as a faith-based weight loss program sold in the back of retail stores had grown into something much more sinister dr todd grande a licensed professional counselor of mental health classified the group as pseudo-christian since gwen was Using biblical passages out of context in order to justify her belief system. Biblical scholars told CBN News that Christians should be skeptical of someone like Gwen, who twisted scriptures to fit her own beliefs. Love Todd Grande. Dr. Grande, I think you you quoted him a couple episodes, one of our other cult ones, maybe Buddhafield or another one. And so when I was doing research for this and his video popped up, I was like, ah, this guy, we love this guy. Oh, yeah. He had he had a really good video. He does. Uh, he answers a lot of things on his YouTube channel that aren't just cult related, but just kind of um, like you do with uh, lawyer stuff. You make it easy for people that are non lawyers to understand. He does the same thing w with medical stuff. Yeah. He has an extremely like calming voice, yeah. too. It's very kind of very soft spoken. And it was very fascinating to hear his breakdown of this because, yeah, he basically said, yes, it's a cult. It ticks all the boxes and you can't just slap a Christian label on it when what you're doing is actually manipulating the teachings to fit your own self-interest. Yep. When asked by News Channel 5 if she was a prophet, Shamblin Laura replied, I don't believe I know what my gift name is, so I'll tell you I'm still wrestling with that. I've been told that for years. Ex-member Tim Smith wrote an account of her status in the church for the organization Spirit Watch, in which he said, 
According to most in the group, she's a heavenly sent prophet, and she believes it too, but you probably won't hear her say it openly herself. There's no real evidence of her being a true prophet, especially if you realize all the 9-11 nonsense is just propaganda. She definitely has done nothing to squash or curb any talk of her prophet status. And if you don't know what that 9-11 is referencing, uh, go back to episode one, because yikes. Yeah, that's what he kind of said, that she would never say I'm a prophet, but people around her Mm -hmm. would say, oh, she's a prophet. And she would go, well, if they say so. Yeah, I mean, it's you're uh, you're not denying anything and you're Mm -hmm. allowing that word of mouth, which is often the best uh, publicity to just trickle Mm -hmm. throughout the congregation and then things, I mean, she's also planting stuff in people's ears. The whole 9-11 thing, she straight up says, like, I told y'all this was going to happen mm-hmm. and nobody listened to me. You know, and I mean, her other sermons that you can see on online, there's a lot of that kind of stuff, too. Of Like, God spoke directly to yeah. me. Well, and also with the 9-11 thing, you know, this guy was in the room and wrote, you know, he, he was skeptical. He's like, it's the same stuff we saw on CNN. But if somebody else is in the room and she walks in and goes, I told y'all 9-11 would happen. I predicted this a few months ago and then leaves. And the people that, you know, witnessed her prophecy coming true, which the church member, the church leader said that's what it was. Then if they're, you know, hook, line and sinker on board with this, they're going to go around and not tell people, oh, she wandered into a newscast of 9-11. And instead of saying, oh, my God, those poor people said I was right, y'all, they're going to say we've watched on television as her prophecy unfolded. Mm-hmm. And you know, so then it does become like an urban legend almost. Oh, yeah. Status. It's a game of telephone. Yeah. Yeah. Smith also recalled that Gwen would degrade and criticize other churches, pastors, and preachers in what Smith saw as an attempt to make her teachings more justified by degrading and finding fault with others. It really became obvious that she was attempting to convince anyone and everyone willing to listen that hers was and is the only true church, and God himself had appointed her as a spokeswoman to spread her message and follow her line of thinking and biblical perspective. If you weren't in Remnant Fellowship, you were in a counterfeit church, and you needed to get out. Additionally, Melba Newsom wrote in Self that eventually the Way Down program appeared to be a recruitment tool for the Remnant Fellowship Church, with teachers telling their online students to leave their current churches calling them counterfeit and telling them you've been lied to all your life. Red flags all over the place. Yeah, that was another thing, too, um, that her sermons were her only. There was no children's sermon, which we Mm -hmm. talked about a little bit in part one, but that any other churches, you know, if someone said, oh, well, my friends go to this other church and they do this great thing, Bible study for the kids that really the kids really connect to. She's like, they're a bunch of that's a joke. That's stupid. Like that's there's nothing that we're never going to do that. I'm the only word of God. You're going to listen to me is what the members were saying. And so you get that again. We start to see this parallels to. I, David Koresh, whoever else, if I'm the prophet, I'm the only line to God. I can, I'm the only one who can tell you what the Bible really means. And that's when I called my friend whose dad was a pastor, pastor forever in the Baptist church. And, you know, he's, he goes to church too. And I said, you know, this is the exact quote of, you know, she said, she's the only line to God. And he's like, that's a cult of personality. That's Mm -hmm. not Christianity at all. And so taking that and using it as a way to, and then taking the weight loss program And telling people, this is just, you know, this could be a supplement to your religious life. And then you get them in. And then once you get them in, you say, by the way, your church is full of shit. Come to our church, you know, and really try to trick them. I think this is when you kind of start seeing that. Not just the recruitment and retention methods, which is very cult-like. I went to many churches growing up. I went to an Episcopalian school for K through 8th. You know, and had many friends there that were Baptist or Catholic and whatever. So, you know, I would go to other several churches in in high school. Uh, two of my best friends were Jewish. So I went to temple with them several times. At none of those places did anyone, a rabbi, a minister, a, a priest ever say, you came from that other church. You better you, you better come over here. They're filling your heads full of lies. Everyone's like, welcome. We welcome all, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. we, uh, we're, we're glad to see you here today. You know, it's, it's, it's a feeling of 
uh, acceptance and and we're we're so honored that you you came to see what we're all about. It's I never heard anyone say or treat me negatively because I didn't believe that religion or attend that church. Of like you've come from the church of lies. Yeah, yeah, no. It's like welcome. There will be cookies and punch in the back. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are churches like that. Sure. And God help you get out. Paris went to a church that he told me about many years ago. Um, about that they started to sort of turn that way of like mm. no other churches and then said, you know, well, we think we're going to start performing exorcisms. And he's like, I'm going to go like that's It's been nice. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, because it, you know, you're uh, it, this isn't a church anymore. It started to become more when they when they do have that. Of Evangelical. Like, the, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't even know if that's the right word for it of like we are kind of like what she's saying of like we're the true church yeah and it's fine to believe in yourself but maybe don't <laughs> set yourself up as like on the par with jesus <laughs> when smith finally left the church gwen made an announcement that he and his family were from satan and not to be associated with she told members that she the church and everyone at remnant were all under attack audio recordings obtained by news channel 5 indicated she demanded obedience, with Shamblin' Laura saying, I have not been put in this position because I'm going to put up with you all's disobedience. If I hear of it, then I will correct it. If I have to come to you, then you're really in trouble. Other dangerous and alarming language she was known to use included, Leave all other loves behind. This is the true church. I've been called to warn the people. That's my job. Yeah, there's a lot of... um the intros to her sermons it's a kind of a slideshow of these words and this music plays in the background and there's cross cuts of her preaching and saying some similar things and so i th it all it, it can get you kind of wrapped up in it i think if you're open to it it definitely mm -hmm. it can seem intoxicating sure the same they do the same thing for the weight loss you mm -hmm. know they have scrolling messages on the big projectors of such and such has lost 52 pounds. Everyone on this stage has lost over 100 pounds. God has allowed. Taken. Yeah, God has taken the weight from, you know, such and such. It's it's you're not just hearing it, but you're seeing it. It's just like every s stimulation to your senses mm -hmm. that, you, you know, to really just indoctrinate you. Oh, for real. Stephen Allen Hassan a mental health counselor and the author of two books about cults, told Self that he believes Remnant is a cult because it uses methods designed to control members' behaviors and emotions. Additionally, members of Remnant that question Shamblin Lara's teachings are told they are being disrespectful and on some occasions have been told to leave the church. According to Hassan, No legitimate religion tells you that you can't check things out. That's the essence of Abrahamic faiths, including Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, to question and to have free will. That's kind of what I was saying about, like, growing up and seeing other people's faiths. No one shamed anyone for doing that, you know, that because mm -hmm. that goes against the teachings of if you're looking at the actual teachings of these religions and not one that you just twisted the scriptures to make it fit something that you wanted it to fit. Well, that was the reason why I stopped going to one church because I uh, it was a Baptist church that I actually I liked, but I had uh, I would go to a Catholic church with my high school friend, and I was I think that's the one I told you we'd go to the buffet afterwards. It was fantastic. Sure. Um, but the Catholic church was so welcoming, so inviting. They were never like you have to take the classes. When are you going to convert? They would be like, let us know if you're interested because you come every week. And then when I started going to this other church, I told my friend, hey, come with me. So she went to the other church with me. And one of the uh, women's Bible study leaders said, we're a real Christian church because she knew that my friend was Catholic and said, unlike some people, oh. unlike some denominations, we're real Christians. And I was like, oh, I, I'm not going to go to this place. Anymore. Oh, yikes. You know, if that's the idea that you again, any type of us versus them mentality mm -hmm. of, and not of we really want you to have a relationship with God and, and to, you know, seek what you're looking for in life. I think that's kind of a red flag to me. For sure. And also dating a person who was not in the church and them saying, we don't really think you should date them because they don't go to our church. And we're that happened to you? That. that happened to me. Yeah. Oh. That same church. 
said, well, we don't really like that you're spending time with this guy because he doesn't go to our church. So. Get, out, get the fuck out of here. Who are you to yeah, tell me who to I date? Did. What are you, my mom? <laughs> I did get the fuck out. I was like, yeah, my parents are stoked that I have a boyfriend because <laughs> I don't bother them anymore. <laughs> In response to being called a cult, among other things, by Rafael Martinez, a reverend with Spirit Watch Ministries, Gwen and Remnant Fellowship attempted to sue him for defamation. In the statements that prompted the lawsuit, published online, Reverend Martinez said, An equally dangerous cult called Remnant Fellowship found itself under scrutiny when two of its members were arrested, tried, and convicted of murdering one of their children when they followed the child-rearing directions of the cult's leadership, self-anointed prophetess Gwen Shamblin and her sycophant lieutenant Ted Anger. When the members, Joseph and Sonia Smith, went to trial, however, Remnant was able to cop a deal with prosecutors and avoid getting dragged into the murder trial. Raphael claimed his statements were true. The court dismissed the case, granting Raphael summary judgment at an early stage. The dismissal was upheld by the Tennessee Court of Appeals, as Gwen and the church failed to accuse Raphael of acting with actual malice. Yeah, she becomes a public figure, selling books and being on the cover of everything and um, putting everything online. So then when you want to accuse someone of defamation... When you're a public figure like she is, and I think at this point, like we are, you know, once you're out there enough, then you can't just say, oh, you recklessly said this untrue thing about me, but that you said this untrue thing about me with the intention to hurt me. And his all along, his defense was this is true, which is a defense to defamation. So it's one thing if, you know, we say something about uh, a stranger, a person down the block that nobody knows, and we, you know, say statements about them that we haven't fully vetted, then in that case, there's not a real high bar of what you have to prove what our intention was of like, you were just being sloppy when you said this about a non-famous person. But when it's a famous person, you really, because we have the First Amendment, right? We have free speech. And so we have these laws that come into, you know, they butt heads with the First Amendment. Essentially, we want to make sure that the standards are high enough that we can protect free speech, but that also, you know, we don't want someone going around, you know, basically lying to the public or misleading them. So because Reverend Martinez was saying this stuff, A, he had a basis in fact to uh, to say it, so he claimed it was true, then Gwen and, and co. could not prove that he was intentionally lying, actual malice is when, you know, you have to prove that he wrote that stuff with the intent to lie about them. He knew for a fact it was false. Um, at, so their claims just failed at the early stage. Yeah, I- I imagine he was writing about it to warn others that that's what not Spirit to, Watch is to join their church. Yeah, yeah. Spirit Watch's whole thing is these offshoot. You know, something like Buddha Field. It's not really rooted in a religion. It's just you know we're a spiritual mm-hmm. group, and it's kind of different. But when someone says we're a church, Spirit Watch Ministries, from my reading of what they do, is go in and say, well, let's vet this, and that way people who are you know, everyday Christians that aren't trying to join a cult so they're not led astray and they don't accidentally get uh, wrapped up in all this. Mm -hmm. Sinisterhood will be right back. By now, pretty much everyone has heard of CBD, and if there was ever a time to get started with CBD, it's now. What both scientists and those who use CBD regularly know is that it helps with daily stresses, but you have to use a quality product to get quality results. Charlotte's Web Hemp Extracts are tested 20-plus times from seed to final product. Unlike many companies, Charlotte's Web has their own proprietary hemp genetics, so the end products are consistent, meaning you know what to expect from each bottle. And they're a mission-driven B Corp, which just means that they've promised to help the planet and humanity and all that good stuff. Speaking of good stuff, I just got some new Calm Gummies from Mm -hmm. Charlotte's Web. They're lemon-lime flavored. I love them. They taste really good they're very refreshing they're they a good are, summer yes. treat i mean i put them in the fridge i, I gotta oh, be careful i, I, like I take them as directed <laughs> but they start to be kind of good and you're like Can I have yeah one? no they're and uh, it's it, i mean i took some i was having a very stressful day the other day i took two which is the recommended dose and honestly within five minutes i really felt calmer and just just chilled out and it was great you know I love my gummies, both the Calm Gummies as well as the Sleep Gummies, because I also take 
my vitamins as gummies because I'm a child and I don't <laughs> like to take other stuff. So I appreciate that Charlotte's Web offers that to me in gummy form. Go to charlottesweb.com and get started with the OG CBD brand who kicked off this whole CBD craze and use code CREEPY at checkout to save 15% on your order. This code works on all CBD products besides bulk bundles. That's charlottesweb.com. Use code CREEPY to save 15% on your order today. On May 29, 2021, at 10.53 a.m., Gwen and Joe's Cessna Citation 501 business jet took off from the Smyrna Airport in Smyrna, Tennessee. Gwen's husband, Joe, was flying the plane. In the audio recording of Joe's interaction with air traffic control, he seemed disoriented. He misread instructions from the control tower and had to be corrected, according to the preliminary report by the NTSB. After takeoff into the very low cloud ceiling of mist, Joe made a series of climbs and descents. An audio recording from inside the cockpit, an alarm can be heard going off, indicating possible mechanical failure, according to the Tennessean. The NTSB reported that the last radar data at 10.55 a.m. showed that the plane was at an altitude of 700 feet, descending at 31,000 feet per minute, before it crashed straight down into Lake Percy Priest, according to a witness fishing nearby. The impact left a debris field that spread over half a mile. All seven people on board were killed, including Joe, Gwen, their son-in-law Brandon Hannah, and church members David and Jennifer Martin and Jessica and Jonathan Walters. So this was um this was a pretty horrific crash. There was a huge debris field where there's I mean, it's just pieces of the plane Mm -hmm. and pilots on YouTube and then pilots that I've called and discussed this with um, said that he in the the audio recording of his air traffic control interactions, that it's almost like when it says disoriented, I think the pilots analyzing it and my personal not that I'm a pilot even close, but having been in a cockpit. He doesn't sound disoriented like he was, like, inebriated or anything like that. He just simply, to me, sounded a bit out of his element. Like, he sounded maybe out of practice. I believe he did not have that many hours in this jet. It was I feel like it was less than 100 hours in this jet. So even if you fly all day long in a smaller airplane, you know, just because you can ride a bicycle doesn't mean you can ride a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And so if you, you are behind the controls without a co-pilot, without somebody else that's been, you know, flying for a really long time that's skilled. And they said the the instruction is they said climb to uh climb to three thousand. And he says, Roger that, climb at or above three thousand. And they said, No, climb to three thousand. You know, they had to correct him on something simple as reading. And also he wasn't using precise uh aviation language to interact with the control tower. So again, it it to me he sounded like Maybe he was out of practice, again, out of his element, or he normally flew with maybe somebody else that took over, mm-hmm. and he was he was trying to do his best. One of the pilots online on YouTube that analyzed this had nothing. I mean, it's like he was, the, this pilot was just interested in the mechanics of the crash. He had no clue who anybody was inside. You know, he just was taking it as uh, face value from all the data that was available, the audio of the cockpit recording, as well as the NTSB report, and his just expertise as a pilot, he was saying that he thought perhaps they had exceeded the maximum airspeed for the citation, which I think is 400 miles an hour, and that that could cause pieces of the plane to fall off. Basically, if you if you hit the throttle too much and you're going too fast and it once, you know, pieces start to fall off, then things are going to malfunction and then you can't maintain control of the aircraft. Also, 31,000 feet per minute is 360 something miles an hour. So if you're at 700 feet and you're going down at 365 miles an hour, no, but they I said mean, it took seconds. It's seconds. Like yeah, I said, yeah. It's that's why they yeah. they I think that's why they calculated it as feet per minute because it seems really fast. And when I looked it up, I was like, that's still. I mean, 300 miles an hour is extremely fast. That's so. I mean, that's why horrifying. there's no. And I believe the area that they crashed into it was two to eight feet deep. It was a sludgy, oh, yikes. swampy area. So it's ostensibly you've crashed directly into the ground. 
And it was a, a bus- you know, a success of citations. You know, it's not enormous jet, but it's also not a tiny plane. But I think what we always say with general aviation aircraft is it's not that the planes are dangerous. Like a citation is well known as an extremely safe aircraft. However, if you, it, it, the barrier to entry to getting one is like you just have to buy one and you just have to have so many hours, then that's when it becomes unsafe is if the pilot has some issue or, you know, even if you only have, if you have only 83 hours in this flight or in this aircraft and something does go wrong, then you don't have that hours and hours of training on how to respond quickly to it. And there's no one that can help you. I mean, you're just, yeah. what do you do at that point, you know? Yeah. And I was like, the, that's the whole thing with a, a being a general aviation pilot is knowing, OK, I've done this before, like almost running drills of like, what happens if this light goes off? What happens if this malfunctions? I don't know that. I mean, who knows? The the members of the church whose families passed away, you know, or, you know, the family members may say, you know, we want to sue the estate of Joe Laura because and by marriage, Gwen Laura, because, you know, it was pilot error. They all may want to sue uh, Cessna, which I think is Textron is their parent company. You know, we're going to sue them because it's a plane malfunction. The NTSB report said that it will be one to two years before the results will be released. Um, a friend of mine who's a professional pilot for an airline said, ah, they usually say that it's probably going to be a couple months because it is kind of a small debris field. And so hopefully they'll be able to, they're essentially having to drag the lake to try to just find whatever possible pieces they can. Yeah. And then they have to sit there and analyze every single piece. As far as that, the alarm going off, another pilot said they listened to the recording and it didn't sound like a failure alarm. It just sounded like almost like a warning. Like if I'm going to, back my car into something and accidentally hit it like it just beeps it doesn't mean that like my engine's gonna explode so they said it sounded more to them like a standard warning sound uh but that that's going to be something that ntsb has to analyze yeah yeah and within that debris they did find human remains and were able to identify that you know the uh, there were i uh, three females and and four four males on on board something like that you're not going to find anything no substantive, though. no the fact that it happened so quickly is what really is just uh, hard to understand. Like, I mean, they took they took off at ten fifty three. At ten fifty five, they were going down. Yeah, he got going that fast, according to that pilot's uh, theory, that he's he revved it that much. Yeah, and that's what the the pilot said and, and some other professional pilots I talked to said, you know, it sounds like a case when it's a thousand foot cloud cover, it's extremely hard to see. You're on instrument flight conditions, which means you can't see anything. Visual flight conditions is where, I mean, it's like a clear day. You take off. You don't even really need to look at your uh, your panel, your instrument panel in front of you because you can see everything, right? And you can see where you're, what direction you're taking off in. You can see, okay, the sun's over there. I know I'm going north, whatever. But in this type of really, really low mist and cloud cover, then you have to fully rely on your instruments. So that takes a highly skilled pilot. And both of the per- the pilots I spoke to and then also the ones on YouTube said it sounded like a case of he took off based on the radar showing how up and down he was. Like he was like a, like basically losing altitude, gaining altitude, losing altitude, gaining altitude, that th- it seemed like a case of pilot disorientation, that he was just the the not being able to see having issues with instruments or whatever and you know that there was some type of confusion and that's why you end up in a very rapid decline descent and ending in an an accident or a crash because you're going that fast you have not even seconds you have like milliseconds to make the right choice Mm -hmm. and one small thing can just cause you to just to go down could it be one of those things Like in diving, when you get disoriented, you don't know Mm -hmm. which is the surface and which is down. So you almost, because of the cloud coverage, you're not sure if you're going up or straight down. And he's just thinking he's going up, but really he's accelerating straight down into the ground. Yeah. And in in our aviation law class in law school, that was something that occurred frequently, especially in areas where there was um, a change in altitude like as far as the land versus maybe there was a a hill or a mountain or something nearby where there's no visibility it's like zero visibility and you're flying solely based on instruments that 
you just get disoriented of where yeah. you're going and you think the mountain was west, but really it was east and you fly headlong east and you go straight into the mountain. And also, you know, a citation jet like that just go, it does, it can go really fast. And that's what the, the pilot on YouTube that analyzed it said that if you really rev it way too fast to think like, okay, well, we have to climb to 3000. I need to climb really rapidly mm -hmm. that if you, overdo it then it can cause mechanical failure on the outside of the plane because items start to fall you know pieces of the plane start falling yeah. off is what that was what he said but ultimately the consensus among professionals so far and this is not the ntsb so they'll be able to really analyze it is that at this point it was really tricky flying conditions someone did question why he did not engage autopilot um and if that would have made any difference or if going that fast if you kind of didn't have time to so. Or it might be he didn't even think of that because, like you said, he's not skilled and trained to, like, make those quick decisions. You just panic and you're not thinking clearly. Yeah, and I mean, if you say, te I have technically enough hours that it's not illegal for me to fly this, that's one thing. But not, I have enough hours that if anything goes wrong, I'm fully confident and capable. And if, you know, it, that's the problem with the general aviation aircraft is a low barrier to entry. And if you think, oh, I flew this one day but it was 75 degrees and completely clear skies versus a foggy day, you know, with steam coming up off of a lake, that's two totally different conditions. And you can't just go, it was like when I rode the motorcycle, if I was riding on a clear sunny day, that's one thing, but it, the day I crashed, it had rained the night before. And so conditions are different. And mm -hmm. I was confident thinking, Oh, I've, I've ridden down this alleyway. It's my house. Like I've ridden down here a million times, but when the conditions change, you can't just operate under the same you know, sure. the same set of skills that you were using before, it's all different. So that's where tons and tons of flight time comes in. And also the amount of the NTSB will look into it as well of being like, okay, you own this Cessna Citation. When is the last, like, how often do you fly a year? Do you fly 50 times a year? Do you fly 150 times a year? Is it all in this citation? Are you left seat, right seat? And figure out like what your skill level should be based on the amount of hours that you spent. Like flying is something you have, it's like we're riding a motorcycle, anything like that. You have to keep on doing it to keep your proficiency up for your, and it's, and it, again, it's like the bare minimum is you have to fly 20 times or whatever, but the genuine, the general consensus is like, you really need to fly like a hundred times. Yeah. Like whatever the minimum is, that's, you don't, when it comes to a extremely fast, dangerous machine, you don't want minimum proficiency. No, you don't want to fuck around with something like that. And like you said, if you only flew 20 times and it was perfect weather those 20 times, then you don't know how to react when you get up there and it's not like that. And they do. And we used to do it in the boats when I worked at Sea Dog, And my friend who's a uh, flight instructor does it of touch and goes where you just practice takeoff and landing. You practice docking and taking off, docking, mm -hmm. and taking off, takeoff and landing, takeoff and landing, because that's some of the trickiest things can happen when it's that really precise ground to air transition, which is seems like what happened here. Following the crash, the church released a statement saying, As far as Remnant Fellowship Church and Way Down Ministries are concerned, Gwen's two children and the church leadership intend to continue the dream that Gwen Champlin Laura had of helping people find a relationship with God. It is a it is very sad for her daughter who lost both her husband and her mom on that mm -hmm. flight. And I think they had four kids together. So all those yeah. kids lost their dad, too. And then both of the couples who were also leaders in the church, they were, there were two sets of husband and, and wives. They all had kids. So mm -hmm. all those kids in one fell swoop lost both their parents. Yeah, I know. And Joe Laura had had children yeah. as well with mm -hmm. his ex. Um, it wasn't his ex-wife, but his ex-girlfriend. So, yeah, there's a lot of family members that, you know, despite the harm Gwen Chamberlain Laura did, it's still people still lost their family members Absolutely. in a horrific way. Yeah. And those kids are going to grow up without parents. It's, that's very sad. HBO Max had worked on a documentary for several years, set to debut in the fall of 2021 with the working title, the Way Down, W-A-Y. Among many other things, the documentary covers the harassment of former members, as well as Lara's custody battle over his children, which the New York Times called bitter and a crucial storyline in the documentary. However, following the plane crash and death of Gwen and Joe, things were complicated. One change was, following Gwen's death, 
there was an increase in former members who were willing to speak out, including relatives of some of the other victims of the crash, according to the New York Times. The producer, Niall Capello, was considering how to move forward, but told the Times that, Within 24 hours, I had heard from every single source, and the first thing everyone said was, I don't want to be disrespectful, but please tell me this doesn't change anything. HBO Max will release the first three episodes on September 30th. However, the final two episodes will not be released until early 2022, as filmmakers cover the crash and its aftermath. Remnant Fellowship reached out to the New York Times after the article was published, saying it denied the false, slanderous, and defamatory statements made about the church and its leaders. According to the New York Times, the documentary will reveal how Remnant Fellowship is an all-encompassing power that took over every aspect of its members' lives, from where they worked and how they dressed to whom they married, and tracks Gwen's ascent into a very thin, heavily made-up avatar whose hair seemed to grow in height in relation to her power. Well, it sounds like a lot of members wanted to be respectful, but also still wanted this story told, and that people that um, perhaps weren't brave enough, or I don't want to say brave enough, but were scared to to come out before this happened, are now willing to talk because maybe they feel like there weren't there won't be as many repercussions against them negatively. Yeah, maybe there's like less backlash mm-hmm. because they were intimidated before. Um, and that's what I mean, I can tell by the, you know, from the interview from The New York Times that the producers, they have spoken to people whose lives were destroyed. They were tortured in their minds, you know, personally, their professions were changed. They moved across the country. They lost family members. And so you want to balance the delicacy of, you know, someone dying in a horrific way with also that does not absolve what they did throughout their lives. And and these victims deserve to have their survivors of this t- mistreatment deserve to have their stories absolutely told. sure if you or someone you love is struggling with an eating disorder you can contact the national eating disorder association helpline to get support resources and treatment options by calling 1-800-931-2237 or visiting their website at nationaleatingdisorders.org well, so what do we think? Well, I remember when someone, you know, when we first got this sent to us, it was because the news broke that she and Joe and, and the other members had died in the plane ca- crash. And a part of me at first thought, you know, kind of like what the producers of the documentary were saying of like, well, you know, do we go forward? But I do want to reiterate that it's almost like if you were abused by a family member and he or she died and then you wanted to tell your story or express yourself and someone else in your family goes, well, they're dead. So you shouldn't just talk about them that way. Like, it's, yeah. you should just forget about it. It's like you can't. That's a ratio of someone's struggles that they've gone through and that the abuse that they've suffered at someone else's hands. And I don't think dying ever, like I said, it doesn't absolve her of what she did and all the harm she's done, all the, the dozens and hundreds of kids that were you know, subjected to that treatment, whether it was the physical abuse or whether it was the psychological harm through being put through these diets when they were, according to experts, way too young to be Mm -hmm. put on those diets. So, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, well, then they can't defend themselves. There's tons of hours of footage of her being confronted with this, and she never, ever, ever backed down. So I think we know, you know what I mean? Like, this documentary wasn't going to change anything, Mm -mm. and our episodes aren't going to, weren't going to change her mind. Um, they seem to like to throw away around the word defamatory and slanderous. Like, my dudes, there's too many recordings of her. Again, if you're quoting someone directly, it's not slanderous. And if you're saying, based on these elements, it's my opinion, it, this is this shares a lot of traits with a cult. That's not slanderous. Get a better lawyer. And so I think that the harm that she did is everlasting. That That's her legacy, sadly, is the harm that she did on these people. And hopefully what those who struggled under her regime, whether it was the church itself or just by virtue of the way down or just her existing in the world as a person that is promoting diet culture and weight as a moral failing. Hopefully, you know, that legacy will be it will show, Okay, it's ended. You know, her family says they want to continue it on. Like, please. No, thanks. Yeah, it's going to be 
I mean, those kids are just as indoctrinated as a lot of the members. Yeah. I mean, more so because they've grown up with it their whole lives. So it's it will be interesting to see if this kind of like with other cults we've seen when the leader dies that they kind of disintegrate. Some people might branch off and start their own thing, but a lot of people just like get out. Will they continue to to keep this up? I imagine they probably feel an even bigger desire to do that now because, you know, mm-hmm. as her legacy, at least in the beginning, maybe, though, with some distance from the whole thing that things will change. I don't know. It'll be I feel like it can go one of two ways. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, and I wonder, too, if, you know, members who were they signed up because of her because that's the danger yeah. when you create a cult of personality that I'm the true prophet well and they said uh, according to I think it was the Tennessee article said she really didn't have a succession plan mm-hmm. in place of if anything happens you know this is what y'all should do you know in my absence who knows maybe she had a private one but the reports were that she didn't and I would imagine if you are exerting ultimate control over a group, you don't even want to think about that. So, of course, sure. you're not going to say, because that was the order of the solar temple, wasn't it, where he started telling his son, like, you're going to be the one to take yeah. over. And then the son starts poking around and goes, oh, this is less smoke and mirrors, you know, BS. I'm not going to keep doing this. Yeah. And so that might be what, you know, who knows? Maybe her, her kids will decide not to continue the harm. I do wonder, though, if your entire financial survival is wrapped up in True. perpetuating a group, a cult, uh, whatever you want to call it, a church. If, if your entire financial survival is wrapped up in that, there's a real big impetus to keep going. Sure. And that was their job was the mm-hmm. the kids program or her daughter and her daughter's husband, who was killed in the plane crash, were in charge of the kids program. And then Michael worked for the church, too. Yeah, they were all involved in it. So that's a very good point. So we'll we'll look for that HBO Max documentary uh, on September thirtieth, twenty twenty one, as well as the the follow ups because I'm I'm definitely interested to hear mem- former members who are willing to go on record and mm-hmm. use their names and everything like that. Yeah, we'll and do an update. We'll. Yeah, I was just about to say we will do an update <laughs> when the time comes. We also had several listeners reach out to us saying they've done this program. Mm -hmm. That they remember, you know, back kind of when it first started doing this program. And one even said, man, I hadn't thought about that in 20 years. But when you said thin eating, it all came back. Wow. And I said to her, like, it's those trigger words. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and that's intentional that they, Mm -hmm. with all cult leaders, like these buzzwords and stuff that stick in you that really, like, those two words like immediately can can take you back to there and can be triggering for a lot of people. And that's all by design. Well, uh, some other people messaged and said uh, they had uh, family members that had joined either that somebody knew someone from high school who moved to Nashville to be a part of the church. Oh, wow. That uprooted their life from California, moved all the way to Nashville. And then someone else said they lived in a adjoining state to Tennessee and that a family member had begun attending online um the online sermons mm-hmm. on Sundays and had kept telling the family, Hey, I think, you know, me and my spouse and the kids are going to move up there. Kind of like we saw with the love has won where you get drawn in by these video sermons and saying, the only way we can save our family is if we move to Nashville and mm-hmm. we join this church, we have to move to Nashville. And the spouse said, listen, we're not doing that. We're not taking the kids out of school. My job is here. No. And the family member said, we were kind of worried that this was going to break up a marriage, that this family member was going to leave on their own and leave their their spouse and kids behind. But that uh, once Gwen passed away, that they thought, well, OK, maybe this is a way for that person to break with the church because yeah. the the sermons were just her talking. And, you know, if you ha- leave, if you lose that avatar, right, that personality, that one person that you put all your hope and faith and trust in and they're gone, even if it's the kid, even if it's the son, the daughter, whoever wants to try to take the place, it's not the same. Mm-hmm. And so maybe that will help break the spell on some of these people who were so deeply like or even just like started to get ingrained oh yeah not just already and i'm sure a lot of family members are hoping that that happens i mean it's the same thing with love is one when Mm -hmm. mother god died you know people were hoping to finally get their spouses back or their children back so Mm -hmm. 
We'll see. We'll keep everyone updated and see what happens next with all this. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation creating this show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including our Am I the Asshole relationship segments, as well as Judge Christie, now with two gavels. <laughs> you also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We'll also hop on occasionally and host monthly Q&As where you can ask us all your burning questions. For our patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. You guys know, we just said it at the top of the show, there's a new merch store available now. Go. <laughs> God, I hope you're hearing this in the future. <laughs> if for some reason it's not, it's because the integration did not go according to plan. But everybody, <laughs> cross your fingers and toes that you are seeing all of this awesome new merch we have right now. True. If you go to the merch page and it's the old merch page, just like... Send good vibes because yeah. we're trying. <laughs> please, still. please know um, I'm curled up in the fetal position somewhere crying <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> we have got all new designs from some phenomenal artists and their Instagrams and their websites are linked in each description. So you can discover new art and get all new cool T-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos. We also have like cool water bottles, tons of stickers. stickers. You guys so, have been asking for them for so long and we have got them now. We figured it out and we got even more designs. So we have tons and tons of stickers for you. So go to Sinisterhood.com and click on shop in the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and follow and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy. I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather. I am on Instagram at Heather versus the world and on Twitter at MCK versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Kayreen. Meg. Zoe Ash. Kate L. Hunker. Robin. Elizabeth Gardner. Brittany. Witty Kitty. Brittany Bloom. Elizabeth. Jennifer Smith. Brittany Newjar. Brianna Powell. Annie Regier. Jessica Garcia. Cassandra Cruz. Charity Byram. Ali Goulet. Anna Flavia Lima. Tammy Goodell, Madeline Nunez, Steph, Tony Lopez, Suzanne Duarte, Kim Parker, Shadia Marie, Jessica Abel, Kate Hudson, Samantha Lemoyne, Shay Hood, Chelsea Berman, Mira Ahmad, Marilyn Lopez, Jackie Spencer, Lindsay Coe, Kim Forsyth, Chris Thompson, Megan Turney, Sonia Bana, Taylor Korn, Abby Argo, Melissa Bone, Aaron C.K., Linda Barlakovich, Savannah Coyne, Sarah Yu, Ross, Gabrielle Bowden, Teresa Hankey, Mars, Laura Sue, Dustin Perez, Stacey Ziegler, Rebecca McCormick, Alice Evans, Taylor LaCitra, Heather Houston, Rebecca Albright, Kinga, Julia Rogers, Lauren Witten, Anna Robbins, Aaron Lefevre, Joni Kane, Madeline McKay, Liz Reeder, Joan McGinnis, Carrie Teal, Michelle Anderson, 
Jasmine the Great, Joe Clark, Ava Dooley, Katie Roof, Jennifer Edwards, Anika Nori, Erica Seals, Kiki Hedden, and Danielle Phillips. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We hope we got your name right. We sincerely appreciate all your support, especially during these trying times. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Sinister. <laughs>